Um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Benjamin. I'm happy to moderate this panel with you. Um, so this panel will deal about the open source powered economy, uh, open source software, hardware, design, uh, and so on. So what are the companies, the project, the business models uh, in, uh, in the world of open source? So uh, around me at the table, I have Zoe Romano from Arduino and Openware. I have Scott Chacon from GitHub, Alastair Parvin from Wikihouse, Olivier Schubert from Goteo, and Pete Lewis from SparkFun. Um, my first question would be very simple. I'll let each of you introduce yourself in two minutes, uh, you, your work, and your company. So, Zoe, please start. Hi, I'm Zoe. I've been working on uh, experimenting on open source uh, fashion since 2005. Uh, trying to build uh, an experiment on how uh, open fashion could uh, empower small producer. And then, building on this experience, I started to get in touch also on the open source hardware community in Italy, and especially with uh, Arduino. And uh, last, uh, since uh, last February, I started to work and collaborate with Arduino, especially regarding uh, the digital identity and how to deal with the, com the huge community of Arduino online and uh, wearable computing. Uh, my name is Patrick Cohn. I'm a co-founder and one of the executive directors of GitHub. Uh, GitHub is a, a site to share source code and to work with, with software, to do software development collaboratively, software development with other people, and to share open source software projects. Uh, my name is Alistair Parvin. I'm working with a. I'm from a collaborative studio called Zero Zero, but we're working on a project called WikiHouse, which is uh, we're working on develop an open source construction system, which essentially uses CNC digital fabrication to make it possible to um, download, adapt, and essentially print out parts for a house, which you can make with no construction skills and not a lot of money. Um, and we're really not a long way along this road towards making a revenue business model. So I have to kind of declare my extreme interest and total ignorance at the outset. Hi, uh, I'm Olivier. I'm a co-founder of Goteo, which means to drop by drop. On every, it's like an irrigation system. That's a translation in, from, from the Spanish original uh, concept. And it's a network, social network, or a platform for crowdfunding plus collaborative uh, distributed collaboration. So, um, and it's all about, it's, it's an open source project. And it's all about founding open projects and creating, funding the commons. So we exclusively helping uh, social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs finding their open d DNA and build a community on the top of that and if, if they don't come with it. And we do lots of assessments, workshops, and we're trying to build a new ecosystem and an open standard for crowdfunding, which is guaranteeing that the crowd is funding and at the end, uh, who's received this funding from the crowd is giving back to the crowd and not only to the people who have put money in the project, but also to society in general. Hi, I'm Pete Lewis. I'm the uh, quality control manager at SparkFun Electronics. And um, we make open source hardware. So we make a lot of education products. Um, it's all electronics. And um, we open source all of our designs. So the, the source files for the printed circuit boards are all available for our customers. Um, a lot of people use our products to make their inventions. So we kind of help a lot of entrepreneurs and hobbyists and just any electronic enthusiasts We've really been focusing on education in the last few years and doing very um, products catering to the beginner and teaching a lot of classes. So that's where our focus is now. But uh, all the products remaining 100% open source. Um, we have about 400 unique products that we manufacture in Colorado. And uh, there's about 1,500 on our online retail store. But 400 of them are designed by us and manufactured by us. Thanks. So. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, number one question, the most obvious that a lot of people uh, face when they want to start an open source project, whether it's for in software or, hard or hardware, which is the business model. Um, obviously, when you uh, give for free your code, your design, or whatever, you still have to make money out of something. So how do you find your R&D? Should you open source everything? everything from the beginning 
is open source um, uh, a good approach for everyone or not? Um, and what are, what are the kind of uh, organizational structures uh, that, uh, that make open source possible? For instance, in the software world, one classical is having a non-profit or a foundation to maintain the code, and a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and companies around it that uh, build on the commons. So we have all these questions, and the, the simple uh, one I would like to ask you is to describe exactly how your companies um, and your project work, what is uh, the, the, the business model, your approach, what are the questions you, you're facing about it? Right. Who would like to start? Um, Can I go first? Yeah, please. That was a lot of questions there. Um, but luckily you did send some of them to us prior to the panel. Yeah. So I have some answers for you. Um, well, we do open source all of our stuff and we do it right from the beginning. Um, and we're lucky that a majority of our products require a relatively small amount of engineering investment. So that R&D cost um, can be recouped quickly before the competition goes ahead and copies our design and replicates the exact product. When you say relatively low, how, how much is it? Uh, in we, terms we spend of time? Like anywhere from one month to four months on most products. Yeah. We have, uh, I believe we have 10 engineers now full-time at SparkFun designing products. But we're, we're going into more advanced products. Um, like a recent release was a, a, a wearable electronics that's used in fashion and it's an MP3 player that is sewable so you can sew the circuit into your clothing. Um, and that product w was in development for almost a year. So that's a, a fair amount of engineering investment. And we're, we're still able to release that open source and recoup that engineering cost, um, even though in the next you know, four or five months, our competitors will probably have a very similar product using that. Um, so that's how we're able to open source from the beginning. Um, and we, we often look at our customer base as um, they only shop with us once and they, they get the tools they need to learn what they're trying to design, but then they can move on and shop elsewhere. So we're, we're kind of like the educators and the enablers of uh, the beginner engineers out there. So that, that was touching on uh, open sourcing from the beginning. Can you remind me uh, maybe what was one of the other questions yeah, in the there? Yeah, the key question is uh, the, the approach of SparkFun of your company towards uh, like the business model. I remember uh, um, a quote from uh, Nathan Seidel where he said that basically focusing on uh, the product and open source, like you know, like you have uh, like six weeks or something like this before being copied and that focuses you on uh, innovation and on, on uh, keeping sticking to the product. I think it was six weeks, but I mean, okay. It's sometimes as fast as six weeks. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, it really forces innovation, which is, is good for, for everybody. Um, forces us to be as innovative as we can be, um, and the, the competitors as well. Um, but by constantly innovating and releasing new products, we, we are known for that, and so our customers keep coming back to us first. Um, and oftentimes, our competitors might have that last release for sale, um, and we have the newest release, so we're able to stay ahead of that wave. Okay, who wants to follow up? Oh, yeah. So, uh, Goteo is run by a foundation, it's called uh, uh, Fuentes Abiertas, it's, in, it's based in Spain. Um, translation would be open sources, and uh, Basically, it has been open source even before the code was released because we have built uh, the, the, the whole methodology and, and the ecosystem in itself with the community and with investors, with people coming from different horizons, like even capital risk, uh, um, uh, seed capital. Uh, so we have built a standard based on co-designing, um, the necessity of, of the, the project that needs funding, project that um, stakeholders that uh, multiply the, the money that the civic society is is uh, contributing with. So the fact is that uh, Goteo is replicable in itself. So we have local forks, local nodes with local teams. The local nodes are run by cooperatives. And um, for example, in the Basque country and the Andalusian region, they also get 
Uh, they also get like uh, public funding, which is very European. Uh, and this implies not only the, the source code, it also implies the methodologies, uh, the assessment, the educational programs around uh, uh, teach crowdfunding, the learn by funding process, and uh, how to be how to open initiatives. Because what we really focus on is attract um, you know different actors which are not already uh, publishing or, or pro pro producing digital returns, like uh, you know people from the agriculture, uh, social entrepreneurship. Uh, that can that can share their business plans, for example, to start just something to start with. So we're really looking for uh, 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 helping people to realize the, the the potential of the open source. And on the other side, we have the code is is open source source. We have lots of forks of people setting up setting their own platforms around Goto and improving it. But this is not something we we take care of that much. We're more taking care on the, this ecosystem of federated nodes. So this is also an invitation of uh, if you have a strong community and, and we can start to talk and maybe we can build your own node and we can help with that. So the, the whole methodologies, which is what uh, methodologies, workshops, so the educational programs, which is uh, where we get our sustainability from, is also shared with the local nodes. Alastair? Um, so, I mean, I think in some ways, we were saying earlier that uh, open hardware projects may actually be easier to build revenue around than open software, because you don't have to decide oh, which bits do we should keep open and which bits we don't. For us, it's a kind of no-brainer that in some sense all the IP is open, um, because what you can do is then sell goods and services over and above um, the, uh, the open IP. Um, our, this is all very much in flux, but our conception of that, though, is that if we realize, okay, you know, us plus all these other amazing open hardware projects collectively are making this kind of Wikipedia of stuff. So our, the way we're conceiving of it is that the actual core, like a classic Wikipedia-style Wikipedia model, is that the classic core uh, commons are held you know, by a non-profit foundation um, and in, in trust. And then what that does is it hosts a kind of fairly liberal market who, which will involve amateurs and professionals, all, all kinds of people, uh, sort of hosted a, a market through a platform um, selling things. Now, one of the interesting issues about that, though, and uh, uh, Michelle Bowen's brought this up over there in the previous session, is this issue of exploitation and that we could end up creating a kind of monopoly, uh, including ourselves. Um, so, and it's not just an ideological position as far as we're concerned, it's also a kind of practical thing, which is what happens if we get run over by a bus or whatever. So it's something that we're very much talking at the moment, which is it becomes an issue about governance and, 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 and membership, if you like, and uh, about how that uh, marketplace should needs a kind of set of open charters, a bit like what these guys have been doing, a kind of open charters or protocols which kind of protect that market against being enclosed and attacked, to protect the commons while liberating it and protecting it even from uh, the potential of us monopolizing it. Scott? Uh, yeah, so um, our business model is directly tied to open source in sort of a, a strange way in that we make basically a, a collaboration tool. And so the way that we decided to charge for it in the early days is if it's open source, if you want to share what you're doing, then it's free. And if it's not, then you have to pay us. And it was very simple. Um, and it still is basically that, that same way today. Um, and that's very helpful for us. I mean, it, it has basically helped us grow and become the company we are because if you're encouraging people to, sh you're basically providing an incentive for people to open source something that maybe they wouldn't otherwise, right? And so if they do, then they put it on and they're, they put it on the website and then they're proud of it and then they, they point other people to your website. They, they drive traffic, they drive community of their own accord because they want their thing to be you know, interesting and to have people look at it and things like that. So it's been a, a big factor for us growing our community and sort of, you know, in that case, teaching people, there's no difference between the paid product and the open source product. If you, you know, Ruby on Rails is basically using exactly the same uh, software on GitHub as a company that's paying a thousand dollars a month. They, they have a ton of, uh, you know, traffic and stuff like that. So it's just, is it open source? Are you willing to share this with people or are you not? And so like being able to provide a service where you try to encourage your constituency to share things, you know, obviously is very good for sort of network effects. And then internally we use open source. Um, like I think you were mentioning, we don't open source github.com itself, but we have probably hundreds of libraries and projects that are extracted from the things that we build, including github.com, um, that we host our, you know, on the website, um, which serves a whole 
huge number of purposes that you know people that are familiar with open source are, are uh, familiar with. So you know, finding new talent that are you know, people that contribute to those projects probably share the same sort of domain interests as you do, and so they're good people to sort of you know hire at your company. Uh, sort of a way to test out people to some degree. Um, it's a good way to engage with your community. It's a good way to get people to add features to your website. You know, um, if you open source some parts of it, then they can improve those parts, which is very useful. It's been helpful for us. So there, there's a whole bunch of um, different ways we do that. And so every time that we hire a new employee, um, you know, we, we make very certain that you know, they look at anything that they're producing and they ask themselves, is this a core, does this have core business value only to GitHub? And if it's true, then keep it private because there's no, there's no real use. There, you know, we don't gain that much value from open sourcing it. Um, and other people really don't gain that much value from having it open, from being able to look at it either. And if it's false, then open source it. Like, just put it out there, make sure that the rest of the community can see it. If it's commodity, you know, software commodity of any kind, and share it, and, and we, we get benefits from that. So, but I mean, I think that that's basically true of almost any company, not just any company that produces software at all, not just something that's built on an open source model, right? So, so the approach is basically, by default, open source everything, and if there, you really feel that there is a, uh, uh, a need to protect and to not open source a specific part, then you close it. Right. I'd like to mention one thing about that, because we use GitHub to, um, track all of our changes in our firmware and our hardware files now too. But we actually pay for the subscription for the privatized re repos is what they're called. Um, and what we use that for is during the development phase we keep it private so that we have time to collaborate internally and basically kind of keep it secret until the product goes live. Um, because I feel like if we let the customers get in there and get their hands dirty early on it might be hard to make decisions. Um, so in that way, we are, aren't going open source right at the like, initiation of the idea. It's not until it's past prototype yeah. phase that we open it up. Which gives you these uh, six weeks we were talking about earlier, basically, because that's uh, the time for people to know how it works and maybe copy it if they want to. True. Um, okay. I think that the majority of our customers are DIY hobbyists. Yeah. Um, in developing a product and they're not really interested in competing with us directly for manufacturing the exact same product. Mm -hmm. They, they want to use those source files and integrate them into their own projects. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Zoe, I would like to have uh, your point on, the, um, on the, so the Arduino point of view on this and also uh, because I think like Arduino is one of the um, the, the brands in the open hardware, which is the, the, the strongest also, and which has a great community. And how do you approach like this business model community brand issue at Arduino? So as many of you know, Arduino is, has open source hardware, is based on open source hardware and software. And what is protected actually is the trademark. So uh, the, the boards can be uh, I w everyone can uh, produce it uh, and uh, or clone it sometimes, and but we, they cannot use the, the the logo on it. In in, in this way, protecting the trademark uh, means that not everyone can speak for the Arduino uh, as Arduino, and uh, in a way you preserve uh, the community because we have in the forum 130,000 uh, participants subscribed. So that people should um, know if who is speaking is uh, from the Arduino team or for the Arduino uh, friends and people that are part of the development team or if it's some other people taking care of it. The, the, I think that what is important in the approach of the Arduino is the fact that is the point of view on design because the, uh, the Arduino is made to uh, lower the barrier for non-technical people to approach uh, interactive projects uh, and ha um, dealing with technology. So it's not only about sharing the, um, the code of a project, but is also the way you do it. In which way the documentation is shared, in which way you communicate uh, uh, the project uh, and the, the product. So um, the, a big effort is put uh, um, on uh, the way uh, we produce uh, documentation, on the way people can understand how 
to approach a board or how to approach, for example, we put a lot of effort in releasing the new starter kit. In the new starter kit, there are uh, there is one board and then many other components, and then there is a very nice booklet in which uh, all the projects that you can make, the 15 projects that you can make with this kit are um, um, explained in, uh, in a very nice way with, uh, um, with a focus on design and each, every step of the project uh, is uh, it's very clear, only from a non-technical perspective. So I think that this overall environment that is creating, that the Arduino is creating, it helps uh, um, spreading uh, the approach uh, of uh, technology interactive project into a, a different audience that usually uh, deals with the technology. I think you're raising a very interesting point is here, which is like it's becoming easier and easier to contribute on open source project and to, um, to get knowledge and to start working on your own DIY open hardware open source projects. I feel like there's uh, more and more tools coming and uh, practices and communities to help you around this. And uh, I think, for instance, GitHub in the software world basically has opened the um, open source to l a whole new uh, lot of people who are not practicing um, on open source projects before because it was uh, too costly to contribute. You had to coordinate a large amount of people. So basically, you open small contributions for people to contribute. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's true of still most other industries other than software development, right? I mean, in software development, it is, it is becoming easier, like sites like GitHub and, you know, there are, there are other types of sites um, that make it easy to, to collaborate in software. And part of that is because, you know, merging projects is relatively easy to do. On, in other work, you know, in other industries, the sort of work product is not mergeable. So it's really just if you're sharing, if, it's, if you're like open sourcing something, what that basically means is broadcasting it. It means I'm making it available for somebody else to look at. It is not saying I'm making it easy for somebody to collaborate with me on it, right, or to help me make it better. And so I think the reason that GitHub is popular, you know, one of the reasons is because we, tried, we try to put a lot of focus into trying to make it as easy as possible for multiple people to get a project farther along, to make it easier on all of the group members than just having one person work on something, right, to make it easier to work together than it is to work by yourself on something. And, like most other places, the hardware, you know, there's, it's awesome to be able to share something because then you can learn from other people, but it's still not easy to collaborate, right? It's still not easier to do a circuit board design or, or a hardware, you know, STL file or something um, with two people than it is with one person. It's almost always easier to do it with, as one person, right? And if somebody changes something and says, here, this is better, is it easy to say, yes, you're right, I want to merge that and, and take it in, or is it actually a huge pain in the ass for you, right? Like, do you even want people trying to contribute to your project, or is that just taking a lot of time out of your day? Well, a big challenge in the hardware world is uh, footprint design. Um, and what I, when I say footprint, I'm talking about the actual spacing of the pads on the circuit board. That's challenging work. It's some of the hardest stuff. Um, and so that is something that is like a, it's usually, we have one large library of all the footprints. And so in the hardware world, we are able to collaborate using GitHub um, and, and merge parts into the library. But the, like, like you said, when it's a specific PCB, like one printed circuit board, the design, having two people work on it at the same time, I don't know if that's ever been done um, at the exact same time. But with the library, the parts that go into that circuit, um, we've been able to do lots of people collaborating. We're talking a lot about like digital uh, commons that are built on. Yeah. Uh, I think we don't have to lose the perspective of uh, newcomers. So um, we talk about like, small manufacturers like shoemakers that right now have no market anymore and could learn from these hacking uh, strategies, learn from these open business models, learn to be more social, learn to be more open, hack their own machines and find people in, in already active in the communities of, uh, you know. I think this is very important because uh, on that side we still have to work a lot on standards, on social commitments, on social contracts between someone who's coming from the ecological world, which is in producing digital commons, 
And uh, as part of Goteo, we tell him, as part of the chart, you have to define when you want to get funding or get help from people, you have to define what will be the digital commons you will produce around your project. So if you're not trained as, all right, I need to build a manual, I need to, uh, to know how you can build a manual, it's not only about getting a manual downloaded, it's like, how can I write my own manual? It's also about like, in a, in more in a, in a third sector, like many, many NGOs create lots of value, social value, good of, of social good, but it's not social commons, it's not g common goods. We have to teach them how to share their, uh, you know, their data, work with open data, so we have to work on new formats. We have the digital format, but we have a, also to define social charts and social contracts to attract new, new commerce. And this is also something very, in, in, uh, I think the, the, the future, and, and, and this is something that Arduino, that SparkFun, Spark and Goteo, and, and I guess uh, and the, the, the house, the wiki house too, it's like, I mean, we need a kid starter, not a Kickstarter. We need like young kids to build uh, cooperatives in, the, in, in high school, even in primary schools, and work on these models. So it's not only about teaching them how to solve or build something on top of open hardware. It's like to teach them, hey, you'll be the future entrepreneurs, and you'll be their competitors. So we have to learn on, you know, we need to, to focus a lot of, on, on education yeah, programs. Totally. Um, speaking about Wikihouse, I'm uh, very curious to uh, learn about your approach to c community and collaboration on this kind of uh, project, because obviously your, your, what you're building is extremely appealing to local communities, because it's uh, like we're talking about housing there. So what's your approach on this? Um, yeah. It, I mean, our approach is actually work out, work out what the hell we're doing as we go along. Um, but it's really, really interesting because um, it comes up against these, these different tiers of openness that we're talking about, which is um, there's making your IP open of what you've done. There's the openness of your organization, which we've talked about a bit. But um, there's this key thing of lowering the threshold. So actually, the disruption of what we're doing is you, the whole point of say just making one open source house is not necessarily that useful because it's all about context, local need, local climate. So actually what we're making open are these tools that lower the threshold. So that's, you know, right now, a lot of the last few years, architects have been using parametric design tools to um, make funny shapes, basically. And we're like, well, don't do that. Don't raise the bar, lower the threshold. So we can use these parametric tools to do this thing of making it really easy for anybody to, to design and, and going to go, you know, go through those processes. But that is a, still a really interesting problem because it, it just looks like we're, um, like you say, giving away more and more power. Because that, that's the only realistic way to deal with contextualization, which is every single development project is different. The real thing is that, say, if you're going to have these, in order to do that, cont that contextual knowledge isn't just the climate. That's the first thing we can integrate. That's easy. The next thing is planning laws, certification access to land, all those kind of things are really, really interesting. It's where it starts crossing over into open data. Again, it's this thing of, uh, that, that's commons, like, and that, that, ha that has to be open enough that other people can kind of engage and start contributing and plugging into that stuff in a way that isn't, yeah, potentially kind of being exploited or anything like that. Um, I'm, Zoe, I'm going to ask you uh, to maybe take your other hat, which <laughs> is uh, openware. Maybe you were anticipating this already. No, I wanted to add uh, regarding... Okay, no, pl please do, please do, if you the, want the, to. The fact that, uh, especially uh, the, the thing I learned um, uh, dealing with the fashion and the world of uh, the fashion exactly. sector is that uh, low IP doesn't mean automatic automatically dealing with a culture of sharing. Because, for example, the fashion sector works on low IP, on products, so the codes to make the garments, the patterns are not protected because uh, act actually the, the industry uh, earns money out of uh, um, having people copying uh, and uh, um, selling knockoffs, uh, cheaper knockoffs. So the thing is, if you protect every single garment that comes out, it, it takes forever to, and so you couldn't have a collection coming out every six months. Uh, so what is protected is the brand. But if you see, the, the, um, the codes of the garments that are sold are not at all shared. So there is not, not a culture of sharing. This is and the same in architecture, by the way, that anyone, like the people have copied architecture. But actually, you don't get that many IP cases in architecture either, because it's the thresholds and the brands that have the power, not the IP. And, and so when I was starting with my project in involving a small producer in open source fashion, 
uh, and I was telling them the fact of public, uh, um, putting online the, the codes of their garments, they were afraid. And, and they were saying, oh my God, but, and then everyone can make one. And so they, and I said, yes, but everyone will know that you started doing this and everyone can, could participate in what you're doing. So uh, then in, in, in years it came out that actually publishing and putting online what you do and uh, having a community recognizing your work as a small producer will preserve you from people copying from you and not rec recognizing your work. So you have a small fashion producer that are afraid to share, so they only sell their garments in small markets, but everyone can go there and just uh, reverse engineer what they, what they do. But there are examples, for example, in, on Etsy, of people being copied by big companies and then the community recognizing the fact that a small producer was copied by a big company and creating campaigns into denouncing this effect. So right now we, we are witnessing that actually sharing things and being more public online, it can preserve this, uh, this problem. I'd actually quite like to know, I don't know if you, any of you guys know, is, have there ever been any um, big legal cases around, say, CC licenses and stuff like that? Because a lot of this stuff is done on kind of trust, right? Like we do it, but a lot of the organizations who share their stuff under CC are so small that even if someone violated it, they wouldn't really have the, cap the capability to go after someone, mm -hmm. which is, I, I'm just interested in that. No, I, I mean, there are some examples. There is this nice blog that is called uh, You Thought We Didn't Notice, uh, and so they publish uh, 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 the, the real one and the knockoffs, and they receive emails from a small producer, but sometimes uh, when this happens, then the small producer send email to the big company and sometimes, most of the times, it, it ends that they pay some, some fee or something like that to keep the design. Uh, in Spain, we're lucky. We have a, a, a team of uh, experts and lawyers that are uh, shared by the community, uh, which have uh, won cases, in, uh, in journalism cases, of violation of a CC license by a, a new, big newspaper, which has been won, and also stuff like uh, 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 cases against collecting uh, rights societies, um, you know, like bars that play only Creative Commons music that would be obliged to pay a fee to the collecting society when there's no copyright involved. So th these cases are, have also been won, for example. So this, we, we're pretty in, uh, advanced in that case. And so it's interesting that you raise the, the topic of licenses so because maybe just a quick, quick word, but on, I think like on hardware, this is typically one of the missing points uh, today because there are not that much uh, on, the, um, on the licenses. When you open a source of project hardware, there is no uh, legal or um, um, standard on this. We have a license called Beerware. <laughs> and it says, uh, if you use this code and you run into me at a bar, you better buy me a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Be aware? No, beer wear. <laughs> it's like freeware, open source wear. Um, but we also put Creative Commons on there. Um, our engineers kind of have fun with the beer wear one. They can write whatever sentence they want so you, after that. You dual license it? I mean, I'm serious. Do you put both licenses on things that you release, or do you just have ones that you just do beer wear? We dual license. So the Creative it's Commons is on all the board, <coughs> all okay. the board files. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, actually on the code, there, there are, there's occasions when we're reviewing code and all there is is beerware at the top and we say, okay, let's release this. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. We, we run into this all the time with, with um, you know, people trying to use source code off of GitHub. And actually one of the things that, that seems funny is stuff like the, the non-standard licenses, like there's a FUGPL license, which is like the exact opposite of the GPL for people that really hate the GPL. Um, and then there's you know beerware and there's there's things like that which are funny but it's actually it's it's not great for the software project because it's non-standard and if a company tries to use that software that actually has lawyers working there then they're going to be like I can't like we simply can't use this because I can't make sure that we comply with if one of our employees meets this like somebody from this company in a bar that they actually bought him a beer and then are we in violation of the license can be literally like i've heard these conversations happen so like i would i would suggest so everybody 
almost everything at GitHub uses Apache or MIT because it's, they're just, they're the least headachey licenses in the world, right? You don't have to verify compliance. You don't, it, that people can use them for anything. You have patent protection with the Apache one. So everything that we release is one, either MIT or Apache. Um, because it's just simplest from us, which is what we're trying to go for is simple, right? Let people use it. I don't want to care about what you're doing with it. You can use it to compete with us. It's fine. You know, I'm, we'll, I, I, that, is the, that is not what we should be competing on, right? This, the software that we're open sourcing should be, should be funded, a commodity of, of sorts, right? We should be working together. I mean, we actually work with some of our competitors on source code that crosses domains um, because, you know, it's in neither of our best interest to both be implementing it, right? So... Just shortly about licensing on the, on the other side of the chain. Uh, just because, again, I, I repeat, when you, you want to get founded by, uh, through Goteo, you need to make a straight commitment on choosing the license before you actually produce. So sometimes what we have seen is that people during the production process have changed the license to a more open one because they have been receptive to the, to the community. And also, we have uh, detected that lots of compulsive backers of open projects on Goteo look for projects to found by looking by licenses. Also by looking by who's producing uh, educational manuals. I don't want to know about who's behind the projects. I want to see educational manuals and I'm, I'm, I may found it. I may found it because it only used GBL. So we have, we, this is a, some kind of a new, uh, a new tendency. And I think we now, right now we're working on a, uh, it's more a technological thing, but I mean, as part of this standard, we need to uh, be able to, you know, to, to get the metadata in, in order to, when you look at in Google, Creative Commons product, uh, projects, you also need to find projects that are, need funding and will be produced under these licenses. Not only projects that already have applied the license to something that mm. it's, is already produced. So this is also something we are, we are, which is pending. This is very interesting. And regarding the license in the project Openware, we created a license for the um, collaborative collection that are uh, published on the website. So there are these uh, seminars uh, uh, to create a collaborative collection and this coll the codes of the co this collection are released and everyone can, part of the community can download the codes and produce and sell the garments coming from this code. You can also change the, the codes and create a, a derivative garment from this code, and, but you have to release it with the same license, so you can work upon this. Uh, there's, there's another aspect which I'd like to bring in because it's a big deal for us, which is a big unknown. I guess there's two big unknowns, actually. I'd like to just shout this out. The one is, at the moment, we copied uh, Arduino's approach to the trademark thing, so at the moment we control it, but as I said earlier, we want to find a way to, to, for us to not necessarily control it. But this other one is this issue of liability, right, which is, you know, when open software goes wrong, people lose time and money. Often, when open hardware goes wrong, they lose limbs. And we're arguably taking that to a level of risk that most people aren't. Like even when your products go wrong, I, I'm really interested to know how you deal with it. There's a level of risk, but if a building falls down, okay, we're probably not as bad as someone 3D printing guns, but you know, th there's risk around that. And this is idea mm. of actually, there's some kind of deep legal stuff in there about uh, liability, even yeah. when you shared stuff openly. And especially in Europe, it, with the norms and the standards you have in Europe. Yeah, well, meeting, as I was saying before in our session, certification and so forth, there are standards for that. And at the moment, yeah. it's project by project. Yeah. Um, and sure, in the future, maybe we'll be able to bring a way to have, uh, across all these kind of projects, kind of open certification methods that are more pliable than our existing certification methods. But let's not snag them off as bureaucracy, right? Safety standards were invented for a reason, right? It's good. Uh, but we just need to find more open compliable versions, but that's not quite the same as this issue, which is the fun, yeah, fundamental deeper liability, which is if someone kills themselves. I mean, there's... Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. But last one, and after that, we're going to take questions from your audience. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to say that it also, like, you should think, if you're licensing stuff, like, if you're trying to figure out how you're, like, what you're going to share and how you're going to share it, um, you should also kind of keep in mind the level of trust that you have with your community. Like, what, what, what is your expected level of trust with the community that you're sharing this with? Because... Like you can you can choose really sort of draconian draconian licenses. I would I would 
encourage you to try to be as, as open and trusting of your community as possible because most of the time they'll reciprocate, right? The more open and trusting you are with your community in multiple ways, but specifically with sharing and open source, then th they'll sort of be that same way back to you. And if one or two people is not, like, is that really the end of the world? Should you even be worrying about it? Like, like what gains are you getting from trusting your community versus not trusting your community? So, like, like I mean, it kind of comes back, <laughs> sorry, it kind of comes back to the beer thing. Like, like, I mean, sure, I could force you to buy me a beer via contract, you know, when we meet, but that's just sort of like beer prostitution at that point. Like, I, I want to meet you at a bar and have my software be so good that you want to buy me a beer, right? Which, which, you know, I mean, you should just kind of consider, not probably not consider the beer prostitution bar, but like consider like how much you trust your community and, and, and you know, what, what you think will be reciprocal. I like both, the beerware and the CC. Yeah. That way you get a beer out of the deals yeah. too. <laughs> beer is important. Not cocaine and whatever. No. Yeah. Oh, hey. <laughs> okay, we're going. So, uh, who has a question in the audience? Yeah. Hello. I'm, my name is Guillaume. I'm a journalist. I want to know what what is the business model with forks. Uh, oh. You, Olivier, yeah, said um, forks is not a problem. We uh, have forks, and uh, but uh, it seems like copycat. You know, what's the difference between forks and copycat or something? Like that? Oh, I just mentioned there's. Uh, if we consider our repository on GitHub as a garden, we have one part of the garden which we don't take much care of. The community is is messing it up and sometimes there's a boomerang effect a uh, feature is developed and we integrate it what i mean is that we, we really act with more care with the federated federated forks these are forks that share values with goteo all right uh, this is very different so share values and share services and we share a business model so a, a federated fork is run by a cooperative locally and we share services. A bit like a franquicias. How do you say franquicias? Uh, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll look, I'll look later on. But I mean, that's... Franchising. Franchising. It's an open franchise somehow. Okay. okay. Any other question? Um, yeah, I used to work for Sun Microsystems. And they're the, uh, at the point when they were open sourcing everything. And the business model there was that um, um, the uh, open source licenses, if you look at them, don't have any guarantees, warranties with them, right? They're, uh, they're, they're given away. You do whatever you want with it, but don't come and complain. And then the, uh, the model is uh, the security licensing, the support, and all of that, uh, which wasn't mentioned here. But I, I wonder um, how, much, uh, how much that plays in, the, in there. Um, in smaller companies, so for, for something like Sun Microsystems, which had a huge amount of code, and which had banks as its, uh, who is selling to banks, the banks don't want to go and start writing code because that's very expensive. Uh, they'd rather pay the license, but they get the guarantee that the code is open so that if Sun or the company does go under or doesn't have the time or the manpower to deal with it, they can go in and look at the code and, and improve it themselves in, in, in the very dangerous or uh, needy cases. So what's the question? So that works for Sun, but now for smaller companies, is, this, uh, is there an experience on that also that you have? So, I mean, we open source a lot of stuff, and we have almost entirely a developer community um, who you know, actually cares about this, you know, the stuff that we're open sourcing. I mean, a lot of Sun's um, customers are enterprise you know, people, purchasers, stuff like that, that don't really care whether the source is open or not. Like they care if they're, may, maybe they want to know that they're going to get an open source at the end as like a check box, but they don't really care about that because it's so hard. It's such a hard problem if Sun actually goes out of business anyways, right? But so we open source a lot of stuff. There is sort of an implied level of support when, you, when we open source something under GitHub. One of the interesting things, so we took on some money. We, had, we were bootstrapped for four years. When we took on uh, funding um, as a, sort of a growth round, um, the investors wanted IP rights, so they wanted every all of the all of the people that worked at, at GitHub. Um, whatever you're working on while you're at GitHub, the company owns the IP, which is fairly standard at an American company. We didn't want to do that at all, and so we compromised where 
if, you, if a, an employee decides to open source something, if they open source it under GitHub's user, under the org, then it's GitHub's IP. And if it's under their personal account, it's their IP. And sort of the internal implication is that if you open source it under the GitHub, GitHub owns it and provides some level of support for it, right? Because otherwise, we simply won't open source it. So there's like the Android client that we have that's open sourced, and the person that the team that developed that has sort of, they, they curate, right? They look at forks or at the, the pull requests that come in, they respond to them, they close them down, they merge them in, they redeploy, they, they, they keep it going. The teams that don't want to, they either do it personally and they decide whether they're gonna support it or not, but it doesn't reflect on us, or um, they simply don't open source it. So like our Mac, Git, GitHub for Mac team, they, they, don't, they don't want to deal with the open source community by letting people down, by not wanting to, you know, take, to, to sort of curate that. And so they've decided not to do it for now. So, I mean, it, it, it depends in the company, but I think a lot of companies are finding, they, they assume that open sourcing means some, some level of support, not technical support, but like supporting the developers that are trying to, to, to work on it, right? And then otherwise there's stuff like Red Hat that does like commercial licenses if you want somebody to call or like GitHub Enterprise or something, right? Does that answer and, the question? And, uh, and, and you have also the support of the community. I mean, depending on your product, um, no? What's that? I mean, you, you can have also the support from, your, from the community, basically, which also helps each other. I mean, for an Arduino, for instance, or? No, for sure. I mean, the, yeah. the community is uh, the first that uh, is interesting and curious to give feedback uh, and uh, solve problems and give uh, the, um, an opinion on, on, on what's out and what they access to. Mm. I'd like to mention, too, that at SparkFun, one of our largest departments is our tech support and customer service. Like, that's how you build brand, I feel. Like, you stand behind your product and you give support to those people that are having trouble with it. And if it's a legitimate enough problem, then you integrate more documentation so that it doesn't keep coming up. Any other question? No? Is that iPad gonna like explode now? Yeah, exactly, because it's red. Yeah, five it says tap to reset. I wonder if it's gonna explode when we tap it. Okay, so let's call it a day, I think. Th thank you all for all your uh, insights and thank you all for your attention.